Hey guys, well, I am very excited to be talking with Kristen Powers today. She is an author, she is a contributor um, and columnist, and a CNN political analyst. Um, so thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So great so, to see your face. <laughs> yeah, you have a new book launching called Saving Grace. Um, speak your truth, stay centered, and learn to coexist with people who drive you nuts. And I think that there is nothing more timely than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I it's um when I first came up with the idea, which was a couple of years ago, it seemed super timely. And now mm -hmm. it's like, wow. <laughs> wow. It's still timely. <laughs> Even more so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and more so. Exactly. It's like, no, we have a whole bunch of other things to disagree about. Yeah. <laughs> that we absolutely. I mean, let's jump in there. I know that this is, you know, this is a big question, but like, how do you feel like the last couple of years with the pandemic and with George Floyd and everything going on, how has that contributed to some of the polarization that we were already in? Yeah, I think that to me, the big turning point was Donald Trump. When I look yeah. back, that's where the shift was. Of course, we had polarization, yeah. but I feel like this is something different. Mm -hmm. And certainly when I've talked to other people, it feels very different. People do sort of point back to that as, as being a real turning point where, for example, people might have someone in their family who was a Republican and they were a Democrat and it, it wasn't, it wasn't causing the kind of rifts. I mean, as we know, relationships are ending, uh, people really do feel like they're going crazy. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I feel like when Donald Trump came in, he just sort of poured gasoline on the fire. <laughs> so the fire was already there, but yeah. it went to another level. And that was certainly my experience. So mm -hmm. as somebody who used to be, at, is left of center, but used mm -hmm. to work at Fox News and was mm -hmm. around a lot of people who thought differently than me, um, it, it was a very different kind of experience than where I, I started to see even myself dehumanizing people, demonizing people, maybe, maybe just in my head, I wasn't necessarily saying it out loud, but I was certainly thinking it and it was certainly affecting me. And when I really hit the wall is when I realized that my thoughts and behavior sometimes even were not aligned with what I said, I believed. And Tell so, me more about that. Like, you know, yeah. were there any specific examples where you had a moment of come to Jesus of like, oh my gosh, yeah. I'm behaving in the way that I say that I don't want to. Totally. Yeah. I really, I, in 2018 is really when it started. And I just was so filled with just rage and contempt and hatred. And just, I couldn't even, honestly, when I would go to work and there would be a Trump supporter there, like I couldn't even interact with mm. them. Right. Mm -hmm. Just the basics. Like, how are you? Uh, how's your family? I just, how are like, your children? Don't even talk to me. Yeah. Um, and I, and so I, um, and so I really did hit a wall and I was spending way, 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 way too much on time on Twitter. And I think that's mm -hmm. where some of my most toxic behavior occurred. Um, but most of the most toxic things actually were happening more in my head and were yeah. really impacting me more than anybody else. Yeah. And so I think that, I realized, well, hold on. Like I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I believe in loving your neighbor. I believe in even loving your enemies. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in, in, in thinking the way I'm thinking and, and coming to that realization and actually realizing that I didn't even really care. I didn't even want to try to align it. I, mm -hmm. I really was at a point where I was like, this is mm -hmm. not, this is different. And I really shouldn't be expected to love my enemies in this situation. Yeah. And I felt, you know, I, but something in me was saying th that's not right. And you know, that's not right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really make sense. Like, mm -hmm. are you really suggesting that what you're facing is harder than what Jesus was facing? Mm -hmm. Because that's obviously not the case. And are you suggesting you are facing harder things than what civil rights icons faced who mm -hmm. I revere and who always treated people with grace mm -hmm. and didn't allow that bitterness to consume them. Mm -hmm. And that's why they treated people with grace. It was very much a self-protective uh, thing to do. And also because they believed it probably would have better benefits in terms of, of achieving what they wanted to achieve. So 
I did just have a moment where I just realized this is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. I cannot go on like this. I am not proud of how I feel or my behavior. I was physically sick. I had chronic fatigue. I had fibromyalgia. I had anxiety. I was miserable. Yeah. And so I, I, when I hit the wall, I, I got off social media. I spent some time reflecting on the situation. And then I ended up writing a column where I write at USA Today, basically saying our culture is unbelievably toxic and I'm realizing that I'm contributing to it. Yeah. And so I'm going to take a step back here. My intuition is we need more grace, but I need to really look into that. So it was more of an intuition in the beginning of just feeling like we don't have enough grace for each other. And so that's when I really dove into trying to understand grace, how to practice grace. And this book is the story of that Mm -hmm. process and all of the things that I learned through it. One of the things that I appreciated about your take around grace was that you, you did push back against this myth that grace means being nice or grace means, you know, not holding anyone accountable or grace means being like, great, you can go ahead with your racist views. And, you know, you found this balance of grace with holding true to your beliefs and holding true to the belief that people should be held accountable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when I initially started writing the book, I, I ran up against that and I actually almost gave the money back because I felt like, well, I, you know, I don't like this. Like, I don't really, I want to be able to call things out. I want to be able Mm -hmm. to name things. I want to be a good ally. I want to do all these things. But as I delved deeper into it, I realized that those things actually were not in opposition and that there was this grave misunderstanding about what grace is. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to the civil rights icons, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. or Ruby Sales, who I interviewed for the book or John Lewis, they absolutely were speaking truth and they absolutely were naming the problems in this society. And they were also doing it with incredible grace. And so you see how it's not, it's, it's, it's not actually in opposition, Yeah. but because it's weaponized by people in power, Mm -hmm. then that's where we get that idea where we Mm. sort of get this idea where people say, you know, well, yeah, that guy sexually harassed somebody, but you know, you should really like, just have grace for him. He just made a mistake. And and it's just, oh yeah, that person did something really racist, but you know, just have grace for them. And just everybody's human and we're all sinners. And it's all this spiritual bypassing where it's like, it's like, no, you can have grace for somebody and hold them accountable. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, holding someone accountable is actually an act of grace because when people are held accountable, if, if, if a lot of people who have gotten canceled, as mm-hmm. people like to call it, had people speaking to them about these things earlier on, right? Mm-hmm. And I know some of the people who this happened to, and I know for a fact that they'd been confronted about their behavior. Yeah. And in some cases, I confronted them. Yeah. <laughs> And they didn't care because there were no consequences Yeah, because we lived in a culture that didn't hold people accountable Mm -hmm. for mistreating women or for mistreating marginalized Mm -hmm. people. And so then when they screwed up, it was so spectacular and it was, you know, Mm -hmm. so public so over that. Yeah. That, that really, if someone had held them accountable back here, it would have been such an act of grace. Totally. Right. And, And so I think that the way I define grace, I use the Christian paradigm of unmerited favor, Mm -hmm. but we, we always think of that in terms of us and God Mm -hmm. versus how do we extend that to other people? Mm -hmm. And so what that means is when I see somebody doing something, I talk about their behavior. I don't turn them into a monster. And so that, that is what is grace. It's, it's basically saying, it's, it's saying to other people, you cannot be me And I'm not going to demonize you for that. I'm not going to turn you into, you're not evil. You're not rotten to the core because unfortunately in our sort of binary way of thinking, we often do that. It's like, Mm -hmm. if you don't believe what I believe, or you're Mm -hmm. acting in this way, then you are obviously just a horrible human Mm -hmm. being Mm -hmm. Uh, versus saying, look, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this, but I know this is one aspect of you Mm -hmm. and I'm seeing the humanity in you, even though I may actually not like you, I may even hate you. And 
Uh, but as Richard Rohr always says, loving is not liking. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when you're loving somebody in the way that Jesus loved people, the agape love, mm-hmm. that's not like loving chocolate or loving your sister or loving your friend. That is basically just looking at the person and saying, I love you because I see the divine spark in you. I see the humanity yeah. in you. That doesn't mean you're not held accountable for doing something wrong. Right. It just means right. you're held accountable with humanity. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I love you mentioning this idea of kind of weaponized grace, because I feel like I've been watching that happen in Christian circles around the political landscape where I'll see a pastor from the pulpit say, we just need to have grace for each other and what they really. And then when you listen to them unpack what that means, it's don't talk about politics. Don't talk about it. Right. So grace means let you have your beliefs. Let me have mine. We won't discuss it. There's no accountability. Grace is it blinders, right? Like yeah. let's let, and, and I really appreciate that you're a person who is writing this book on grace. And yet, you know, you had a recent column that was about the reckoning of white supremacy. Like yeah. you're still, you're still going in on things that are difficult and areas that need accountability while still maintaining grace as a posture. I appreciate that. Right. And of course, people will come back and say that's not grace. And so you'll often hear people saying you're not being graceful yeah. if you're calling out racism because yeah. they have this idea that graceful means being a doormat, right? Yeah. And you're just supposed to never say anything. But the other thing that I think is interesting about what you said, where the pastor standing up and saying that, is that it's really a one way street. It's really grace for people who think like that pastor. And it's grace for people who usually powerful people. Yeah. It's usually people who aren't being harmed systemically by the system. It's not the oppressed. It's the minute one of the marginalized people or the people being harmed systemically Mm -hmm. doesn't behave in a perfect manner. Mm. They express their anger at the fact that no one ever listens to them and that they continue to be treated and have in a, in a horrible way and not have their humanity seen. What do they get called? the snowflakes, Mm -hmm. you know, the social justice warriors, they're spoken about with contempt. Mm -hmm. There is no attempt to see them as full human beings who have been pushed to the edge and sometimes over the edge. Yeah. And so, so I, a lot of times have people coming back and saying, why aren't you showing more grace in this situation? It's like, why aren't you showing more grace in Mm -hmm. this situation? Like, why Mm -hmm. are you focused on me? Mm -hmm. Like focus on yourself. Yeah. And And I'm not, not showing grace because I'm not demonizing anybody. I'm just saying that we shouldn't treat undocumented immigrants this way. Yeah. And, you know, and that's not, and I am criticizing it and I am critiquing Mm -hmm. problems in our society, but like, I'm not just going to look the other way. Mm -hmm. And, but so often it's, it's used as a kind of the powerful person who caused the harm that's one. It's always, I mean, in almost all these cancel culture things, it's all of the grace is focused on the person who caused the harm. Mm-hmm. And none of it is focused on the person who mm-hmm. escalated the issue yeah. to raise what's going on. Yeah. And so I, you know, I have a column in me that I still have to write about what, what, what out, what causes you outrage, right? Mm. Because in so many of these cancel culture situations, and I look, I think cancel culture I, first of all, I think cancel culture is a horrible phrase. I shouldn't even use it. But <laughs> what, when people are talking about that, sometimes yeah. it is horrible and sometimes it gets out of control. So I'm yeah. not saying that doesn't happen, but I'm saying in a lot of the times what happens is p- the amount of outrage that is shown over this person, maybe losing their job, for right. example, um, is so massive And yet there is no outrage shown Mm -hmm. about the racism that occurred or that you see what I'm saying? Oh, I totally understand what you're saying. Is it only the person losing the job or is it also Mm -hmm. the fact that this racist thing happened? Right. And instead you just say, well, too bad. That was, you know, the person made a mistake and there's Mm -hmm. no compassion. There's no empathy for the person who's been harmed. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's, that's what we have to watch out for is people who are going to try to weaponize it and say, yeah. well, and I know this is going to happen to me now every day, every time I say anything, they're going to say, why aren't you having more grace? It's like, it's not what grace means. 
Yeah. It's not what grace means. And I think that outrage metric is, is a very interesting thing to look at. I think of, you know, after, um, George Floyd and in the wake of the riots, you know, when I was noticing the people that were having a lot of outrage about the minority of protesters that were turning exactly. violent and, and they just wanted to post about that and talk about the, you know, again, minor, I mean, I went to lots of protests, never saw one turn violent. I know it happened. It for sure happened, but the people who wanted to highlight that and that outrage was greater than what happened to George Floyd. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and also being a person who's been doing this for quite some time, uh, I'm quite familiar with what most people talk about, uh, what most journalists talk about, what most, most pundits talk about. And I just watch these people who are so outraged about the, the rioting who have never said a word about racism. Right. They've never right. said a word about police brutality. It's totally. Like, you don't get to now come in and start yeah. complaining about people yeah. reacting in a way that you don't like when you have never yeah. cared about this issue. Yeah. Right. And it's, and I see this, um, I see this in the men that I work with who I've known my entire adult life, who will go on TV or write an article or tweet and say, cancel culture is out of control because, you know, too many men are losing their jobs over, um, sexual harassment mm -hmm. or these kinds of things. And it's like, it's funny because I've known you my whole adult life and you've never talked about sexism, not a single time. Right. And, and in right. fact, when I talked about it, you rolled your eyes. Yeah. So I'll listen to the person who's actually been engaged in yeah. the, in the situation and, yeah. and who's saying I'm, I'm engaged in this fight. And I think it's gotten a little out of hand. And there are people who say that. Yeah. And I'm willing to listen to that, but I, yeah. but I, I have a very hard time with people who just all of a sudden come into this conversation at the point of complaining about how people are responding to being ignored yeah. for generation after generation after generation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's like, and so I think that I think that you're just hitting exactly on one of the core points. Yeah. Something you, um, mentioned in the book was this idea of us living in a post-truth era. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like we have a similar vibe in that. Like I have a very overdeveloped sense of justice. Like yes. truth. What, what's your Enneagram number? I'm a three. You're an eight, oh, okay. right? I'm an eight. Yeah. 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 I'm a three, but I have a lot of eight leanings. Like I was okay. pretty close to an eight. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm a person who data matters, facts matter. And what happened to facts, <laughs> you know, like what happened to, I mean, it's just wild to yeah. watch an entire, no, I don't want to say generation because this, it, it eludes age, but just watch our people right now really not caring about making sure things are true. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of that is obviously Donald Trump kind of took it to the next level, yeah. but it already kind of existed because of how we have our little bubbles where we go to our yeah. own media and, yeah. and people don't believe anything that doesn't come from their source. Yes. So that's why when you're engaging with somebody with the social science has found in today's post-truth world mm -hmm. is that if you come at somebody with those facts, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to ask you where you got them. Yeah. And the minute you say it's the New York times or the uh -huh. minute they say it's Fox news, the conversation's over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can't actually, there are no, I can't think of anywhere that both groups of people would consider a valid place right. to like trust. We can both agree right? that whatever this source is, is the source. Exactly. Yeah. And so what they found is that what people do trust is your own personal experience and your mm -hmm. own life experience mm -hmm. and perhaps the life experience of your spouse or your best friend or something, but something that's in your universe that you know. And yeah. so if you were to say to somebody, um, so, so one of the things that they're now doing, uh, in terms of political canvassing is something called uh, deep canvassing. So normal political canvassing is you show up and you've got your list of facts, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, hi, I'm here. I think you should support this, this protect, you know, this bill that's going to protect transgender rights. Here are all the reasons you should support it. Mm -hmm. It's not that effective. Mm -hmm. What's effective is the deep canvassing where you have a transgender person 
mm-hmm. go out and say, mm-hmm. hi, I'm here to talk to you about this and right. you start a conversation you mm-hmm. let them share what they feel and what their experience has been. And then you say, well, actually I'm transgender. And can yeah. I tell you a little bit about my story? Yeah. And then they tell a little bit about their story and you, they look everyone, they listen empathically, uh-huh. which is obviously very hard to do, right? It's, this is very hard for somebody to have to sit and listen to somebody saying these things, but what they found was it actually changed people's minds. Yeah. There were actually people who started out saying, I don't understand. Like, what's the point? I don't even get it. Like, why do they need... And they afterwards were yeah. like, I get it. Like, yeah. I, I actually hear what you're saying. And so to the extent you can talk about something that you have personally experienced or somebody close to you has personally yeah. experienced or ask them to think like, do you know anybody who's undocumented? Do you know anybody who's, yeah. you know, struggling with the issue that you're struggling with and kind of um, get them to think about people that they know that helps. And they find with to depolarize people need to think of somebody that they know and that they like and respect doesn't have to be a friend. Mm -hmm. It could, it could literally just be somebody who's a neighbor that they see occasionally and they wave at or whatever they find a minute they can name one person that's in that other. So a Democrat thinking of a Republican or Republican Mm -hmm. thinking of a Democrat, they immediately start to depolarize Mm -hmm. because that, because what we usually do is we think in the abstract. So it's Trump voters. If they're just a big blob, it's if someone else, it's like liberals and they're just a big blob. But the minute you get them down to a real human being, they will not talk about them that way. Usually it's so true. Usually say, yeah, but then you know what they always say, but they're different. Totally. Right. And it's like, but they're not different. And why would they be different? That's not, where did you get that idea? Like, it's not, why, why did you find the unicorn? Like that's pretty unlikely. Yeah. And, and, and look, sometimes (laughs) I should say sometimes knowing people who are, are different than you actually makes it worse. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you'll think because you make that the person, the face of it. Uh So it's not always going to help you. But usually if you just say, who's somebody you like and respect who thinks differently than you. Yeah. Then people will start to say, okay, yeah, actually you're right. I guess they're not all this way. And I mean, I do this, you know, I do this. I mean, I have been very vocal about my feelings about people who are anti-vax. It's very frustrating Mm -hmm. to me. I'm impatient. Like we're so close to solving this and you guys are holding us up. But then I have a very, very close friend who has been, she has not for vaccinated her kids because one of her kids had a, had a vaccine injury. Mm -hmm. And so you know, signed up to get a vaccine when her kid was small, very, very scary incident has since not wanted to vaccinate at all. And I find myself, you know, shouting from the rooftops about the anti-vaxxers. And then I'm like, but, but you're, you're different. Like you have a past because I know you, you know, and it's like, why am I not assuming that other people may have similar fears and experiences right? and humanizing others? I had the same experience where I was talking to a friend about it and she was talking about her nephew. And then I, I was like, well, I don't really know anybody. And then I was like, oh, wait, I do, you know? And I was like, yeah. and she's just a health nut and she's always been afraid of vaccines and she's, yep. she's an amazing, wonderful person, but yeah. like, she'll not get, there's no way she's yeah. ever going to have the va- vaccine. And yeah, suddenly it's like, well, okay. I, I, you know, but that's, that's her. And so you have to think about, you also have to think about the fact of where did, where did a lot of these people get these ideas, right? Mm -hmm. They're trusting people who are telling them this. And, and some of those people are sincere, but I have to say a lot of them aren't. Yeah. There's a massive misinformation campaign Yeah, and people are not going into this with nefarious ideas. They're trusting people that are actively leading them astray. Yeah. Yeah. And they're fearful. And so, so it's, so when people start saying, start really speaking badly about just regular people. I'm just like, you're just mad at the wrong person. Yeah. I agree. It's you need to be focusing on the people who are telling them this because I'm never going to argue that it's people's obligation to be cynical, Mm -hmm. right? They should like, they trust these people. I don't think they should, but they do. And I'm not going to say, Oh, the problem with you is that you're not cynical enough that there are people who lie to make money or there are people Mm -hmm. who lie to gain power that's, you know, something I know because of the world that I live in. Right. Um, but the average person just thinks, no, this person's looking out for me. They're, 
you know, I can yeah. trust them. They're the only people I can yeah. trust. Yeah. Yeah. And that narrative too, that this is the only people that you can trust is reinforced by those voices. Right. So it is, it's, it's the, um, you know, you should mistrust mainstream media and we're the only yeah. voice you should hear. It's, it's all kind of pointing back to that misinformation. Like now, yeah. now truth coming out from reputable sources is, is to be feared. Yeah. And the thing is all of these things, like this is true of conspiracy theories and this is true of even that, which is actually a little bit of a conspiracy theory too, yeah. is there's always a grain of truth. Mm -hmm. And so because there's a grain of truth, the people person mm -hmm. latches onto the grain of truth. Yeah. It is and then true, takes the whole thing. It is true that sometimes the media is really contemptuous about mm -hmm. conservative Christians, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes yeah. it is true. It just yeah. is. And so you could be a conservative Christian looking at that thinking, well, if they're so contemptuous about me, how could I possibly think mm -hmm. that they care about me? Yeah. So there's a grain of truth. Yeah. But the next step of therefore they're lying to you <laughs> right everything right it's just it's a leap it's just going too far yeah, yeah it's like I, I work in the media that's just not what's happening right and the media actually is not filled with ideological people it just isn't now they yeah. may be people who we've seen the studies they vote for democrats but i'm telling you they're not ideological they're just not yeah. and mm -hmm. so it's it's not it's but but because there's a grain of truth people yeah. can latch onto that and feel like, um, I'm going to trust this other person who sees me and says, he's looking out for me or says she's looking out for me, which I have to say, anytime anybody says that it's kind of a red flag. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm the only one you can trust. Yes. I mean, this is how <laughs> cults are born. <laughs> yeah. Um, so red flag, like watch yeah. out for that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, cause I know you mentioned you're left of center. I'm very left of center. A lot of my viewers are left of center, but you have been a bit critical too of, you know, where the liberals are bungling this, this discourse and how liberals are contributing to some of the polarization. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, I wrote my, my first book was on free speech and mm -hmm. how I felt that the left was, you know, silencing people yeah. through a lot of intolerance in this book. I actually, cause one of the things I did was I did kind of an audit of myself, which was just a horrific experience. <laughs> no. so, um, and so, especially because most of the dumb things I have done have been done in public, right? So they're on the internet. Yep. Uh, I have For everyone them. to talk about yes. and judge. I have written yeah. things. I have said things on TV. I have tweeted things that a lot of them I don't even believe anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm just a completely different person. So I, I kind of went back through and I was like, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> I was sort of like, what was I thinking? I don't even know. This is weird, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, one of the things which we can talk about separately is I, I realized I had a lot of issues to deal with and I realized mm -hmm. I had a lot of unresolved trauma, which being an eight, I'm very binary already. And yeah. just when I'm an unhealthy eight, it's just, yeah. ooh, just super black and white and yeah. Lacking in empathy and, yeah. and all of those things. And so I think a lot of that behavior was because of that. Um, I didn't have any room for mystery or nuance or mm -hmm. praise or anything mm -hmm. like that. So, so I think one of the things I did was I go back, I went back and I looked at that book and I don't agree with a lot of what I said. Hmm. I, I do think that there's a problem in terms of sometimes people shut down speakers because they say they're unsafe and they don't want to hear them mm -hmm. where I feel like it would be better to show up and challenge the person. But I also do have empathy for the fact that a lot of the people that are doing this are traumatized. Yeah. So it's, it's a both and kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. wish that people had a different way to process these issues. I wish that traumatized people were getting the help that they needed so that they yeah. could have the capacity to confront that. But yeah. when somebody comes on campus and is challenging sexual assault statistics, it can feel very much to some, like somebody who was sexually assaulted and wasn't believed mm -hmm. that it's happening again. Right. Right. 
um, versus a person who might be able to just show up and say, Hey, I'm going to tell you why you're wrong because it's Mm -hmm. not their trigger. It's not their trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I wish, for example, on campuses that they were doing more seeing this as an opportunity for intervention and saying, gosh, yeah, you need to really be able to get to a place where you aren't, you don't feel so threatened by this that you can either just not go to it or yeah. you can go there and actually argue this. Mm-hmm. So, so I do believe that, but in my book, I just didn't have any empathy. Mm. I had very much this idea that people should be just like me, which was, I was extremely unhealthy. I, I dissociated mm-hmm. when I was in conflict. So it was mm-hmm. very easy for me to show up and have those right. moments because I would dissociate. Yeah. My feelings are way over there. Yeah. I would have no feelings. Yeah. And so I, I was basically like, oh, you know, suck it up was kind Mm -hmm. of the attitude, right? Yeah. I don't feel that way anymore, Mm. uh, especially having processed my trauma and seeing how impactful it was. And so I have more of a, you know, like I said, a both and approach to it. I also think what we have seen in the Trump era is that conservatives are doing all the things that they were complaining about with liberals. They're getting people, you know, canceled from giving speeches, from talking about critical race theory. They're getting people fired. They're doing all those things. And I did say in the book that I felt at the time it was sort of a problem with the left, Mm -hmm. but I said, it's because they control the institutions basically. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, the universities or the, yeah. the media or these different uh-huh. things. I said, if the conservatives get that power, they will do the exact same thing. And here we are, they are doing the exact same thing. Yeah. I just saw they got Nicole Hannah Jones in disinvited from something um, because of, right. she was going to talk about critical race theory. It's like, well, what happened to everybody debating everything and everybody right. hearing things, right? Right. It's out the window. What happened if you free so, speech and freedom? Yeah, what happened is, to, you know, the yeah. solution to bad speech is more speech, all these things. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so I think, I think it's a very, it's a very complicated issue, but yeah, but ultimately it would be great if we could debate things and, mm-hmm. you know, at the same time, there's some things that are crazy making and I don't want to debate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, and I don't think people should be asked to debate their humanity. Absolutely. So if someone's coming on campus and they're going to, uh, say horrible things about trans people, yeah. I don't think trans people should be expected to show up and debate their humanity. And I don't yeah. think that they, sh- I don't think I have any problem with them trying to get that speech canceled because yeah. this person is going to incite hate against them and potentially violence. Yeah. And so, but in my, but back in my previous way of thinking about it, I, I just, I just was disconnected from all of that. I Mm -hmm. wasn't really considering that I wasn't, I I was feeling like, well, I was sexually assaulted and I could show up and do that. It's like, of course you can, because you are completely numb. Yeah. (laughs) And yeah. 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 And it is wild how confronting and dealing with our own traumas does give us more empathy for others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I, I really couldn't, I just didn't have the capacity because, you know, as, as an eight, the way that I felt made myself feel emotionally safe was yeah. just to be like, everything is like super black and white and I can't yeah. see those nuances. So yeah. it's like, if free speech is the thing, then free speech is the thing. And there's yeah. nothing else yeah. versus now I can say like, yes, free speech is important. And so is racism. And right. so are all these yeah. other issues. And it's like, yeah. and their intention and like, where does that fit? It's not that like, it's only free speech. I just, I absolutely lacked the ability to see it differently. And that's what you yeah. learn about trauma is that it, it actually blinds you. And then our brains are just working against us anyway. Even a completely healthy person yeah. is going to be drawn to the arguments that buttress their beliefs, confirmation mm-hmm. bias, For sure. right? A healthy yeah. person who's under stress is going to resort to binary sorting. And often yeah. we just resort to binary sorting because we're overwhelmed and we're busy. Yeah. Yes. And so our brain just starts low hanging like, fruit. I'm just going to make quick decisions because yeah. this is w- how I stay safe. And yeah. that's how we stayed safe a long time ago, but mm-hmm. it doesn't, we don't really need to do it anymore. Yeah. We don't, we, we don't have to make an immediate judgment about another person and put them in the dangerous, bad basket. We actually yeah. have the capacity to slow down and say, take a breath, mm-hmm. you know, and say, what's a way if I use grace in this mm-hmm. s- situation to kind of create some space here mm-hmm. and, and, 
and rather than rather than demonizing or dehumanizing or throwing them out, you know, how can I use boundaries yeah. instead to to make myself feel safe and to yeah. and to protect my sanity. Mm -hmm. Right. Like um, you don't have to engage with every single person. You don't yeah. have to have that conversation if you don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. Along that line, my last question for you is you talked in the book about um, this idea that grace was self-care. Tell yes. me more about that. Cause I loved, I loved that idea. Well, it, it, on a different, a lot of different levels it is, but I think that what I didn't realize, and I think what a lot of other people don't realize is that when we engage in this behavior where we're judging other people and labeling other people, they don't really care mm -hmm. <laughs> for the most part. We're the ones who are harmed, especially because most of it goes on in our heads, right? Yeah. It's, um, or maybe among our friends, we talk about it, but when we do that, we immediately get entangled with the other person. So mm -hmm. if I was at work and I was like, I can't believe they're saying that. Oh my God, I want to kill them. They're so mm -hmm. horrible. They're so awful. I'm thinking about it all the way home. I get uh -huh. inside. I talk to my fiance about it. I lay in bed at night thinking about mm -hmm. the things I should have said and how horrible they are. They're just sleeping like a baby somewhere else. Right. And it's like, totally. but I'm like hurting myself. Totally. And so that's why like MLK said, hate is too great a burden to bear. Like yeah. we're bearing it. And so, yeah. so, so I think it's actually taking care of yourself to say, okay, I see you, I see mm -hmm. what you're saying. I don't agree with it. And I'm going to use boundaries. I'm just saying, going to say no, like yeah. I'm a no to this and I'm going to move on to something else. And I'm going to move on hopefully to something that is my yes. Mm -hmm. I could write a column about it. I could make a thoughtful Facebook post. That's not incendiary about yeah. it. I could volunteer. I could get yeah. money. There's all these other mm -hmm. things I could do that doesn't involve this kind of just fury. Um, yeah. that's not helping anybody. And then I also think grace is self-care because you can't give grace to other people until you learn to give grace to yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so the first thing I had to learn was how to have grace for myself. Yeah. And I, I mentioned my audit and that brought up so much shame mm -hmm. and I had to really work that through with my therapist. And I would talk to my friends about it. I'd be like, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did that. And they'd always say like, where's grace for Kirsten? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you were doing like the, I, yeah. the, the idea of grace is you were doing the best you could with what you had and it wasn't very good, but yeah. it was the best you could do. Yeah. And so like, stop holding her to the standards of today. Totally. Because you're a different person. You have different tools, you have yeah. a different perspective. And so, um, what I found was, I mean, I really think for me, grace is a practice, mm -hmm. right? It's like a yoga practice or something. It's a practice. Yeah. And so when I found when I had grace for myself and I, I was taking care of myself and I was being kind to myself, my capacity to have grace for other people mm -hmm. just grew exponentially. Absolutely. And also part of the practice of grace is humility. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like I said, looking at yourself when you immediately go to, how could someone do that? It's like, well, I mean, I've done some things and, mm -hmm. you know, I may, I don't want people to just think of me as just those things. And so should I think of this person as just those things? And yeah. maybe I should extend them some grace and see them as a whole person, mm -hmm. not the sum of that bad thing that they did. And so yeah. it, it makes you more generous. I think it gives you Absolutely. more of a capacity uh, yeah. to, to offer grace to other people. Yeah. I mean, that resonates so much because I think, you know, we really can't extend anything to others that we don't extend to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, and there is the whole kind of projection thing. We always have to wonder when we're really angry at somebody or really like judging somebody to kind of step back and be like, why is this so triggering to me? Totally. Um, and it's not that there aren't really bad things that happen but it actually is possible. And this was radical for me. Uh, when my therapist said to me, she said, did you know that it's possible to be engaged in social justice and care about these issues and not be miserable? <laughs> and I was like, how, how is that even possible? I don't even understand. Do you mean? <laughs> yeah, no. And it was like, because you're not like, I was acting like I was the savior, right? Like mm -hmm. I have to be upset all the time, talking about it all the time, doing all these things yeah. versus saying, I see it. Mm -hmm. I see it and I want to do something about it. Yeah. Um, but not, not taking all that on, which again was making me physically ill. Yeah. 
Um, I was having horrible anxiety and physical pain and chronic fatigue and all these things. And who's that helping? Yeah. You know, that's not helping anybody. Totally. Um, And so to learn how to see things clearly and discern. Yeah. To be discerning and not judgmental um, is, is, is actually taking care of yourself. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Like how you really cut off that kind of, you know, I do it even when I'm on Twitter, I see something and I'm just like, Nope, uh-huh. and I just keep going. Uh-huh. It's just, I'm done. It's over. And I literally don't think about it again. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't yeah. engage with it. I'm just like, that's a no. Totally. I did the same thing yesterday. Matt Walsh said something and I was like, <laughs> and then I'm like, walk away, just walk away. Like walk this away. is what he wants. You riled up. Yeah. And- yeah. 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 But I'm sure Walk if away. you had replied, he would have totally changed his mind. I could have, I think I could have been the person <laughs> yeah. to finally And there would have been him. no disagreements and it wouldn't have been misrepresented or any of those things because all the problems get solved on social yes. media. <laughs> yes. Minds are changed left and right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh my word. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. Um, So this is going to air on your book launch date. So it is available everywhere books are sold. Um, And I just, I think it's just so timely and so important. So I hope people will grab it. Thank you. Where can people find you online? Um, Everything's at Kirsten Powers. So K-I-R-S-T-E-N Powers. So, but thank you for this. And thank you for your voice. And yeah. Culture and for speaking up for people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Keep doing it. Okay. Talk to you later. Mm-hmm.